All right, we're live on Facebook. Paul Swearingen here from the Nonpartisan Evangelical and with one of our regular contributors, writers, and a true uh, nonpartisan evangelical himself, Lauren D'Amico, is with us. Happy Friday, Lauren. Yes, happy Friday. It is definitely time for the weekend. I saw some of your, you're from Wisconsin. I saw some of your senators and representatives on the uh, Democratic National Convention last night. Yeah, we got to host here in Milwaukee, uh, such, such as it is this year. You know, there's not, not that many people here in person, but there's is definitely some uh, activity going on in Milwaukee. And I know the uh, Vote Common Good team as well has been out in Milwaukee the past several days. Ah, very good. Yeah, I've seen some of their stuff as they're out. And I think, aren't they marching towards Washington now or sometime soon or something? I believe there's something like that happening. I think they're, I forget where they're starting, maybe in Virginia, I want to say, some somewhere in that area, yeah. and, and then marching to, to D.C. Well, very good. Um, looking forward to chatting. We have a couple of blogs that are create, creating quite a few ripples out there, so we wanted to get some discussion in around it. We're live on Facebook. Glad you're with us from the Nonpartisan Evangelical. Love to see your comments and shares and all of those good things. Let people know that we're talking about uh, a religious view of politics that's outside the normal um uh, partisan right-wing view of right-wing evangelicalism. And, and Lauren has a, a Facebook page called Intersecting Faith and Politics that has these discussions. So we're talking about politics. We're talking about religion. We're critiquing a little bit of what we've seen in evangelicalism for a long time. But in the end, we're still partners with our evangelical brothers and sisters in trying to advance the kingdom of heaven on earth. So in that vein, Lauren, why don't you start us off with some prayer today to get us going on our Facebook Live? Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, so Father, I just thank you for this time that we get to share with each other, Father. And and I, I pray, as, as my old pastor used to pray, Father, that you would hide us behind your cross, God, that you would give us your words to share with, with this audience, with this group of, of believers and, and unbelievers, Father, that may be listening during this time, God. So I just pray that you would you would guide our conversation, Father. We have we have the things prepped that we want to share, but but we just turn this time over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well done. So we're, we, we sort of repurposed one of your older uh, blogs, and I think that's worth doing from time to time. Uh, we've, we've talked about you before on this podcast as a rarity, a liberal evangelical uh, who, who votes Democrat and all of those things. I have friends that think that's not possible, that you can't be a Democrat and vote, uh, or be a Christian and vote Democratic. But your, your blog raised some interesting points, and, and, and I've tried to change the discussion about abortion from being just about criminalizing people and creating a law to how can we actually start to go after having less abortions and less unwanted pregnancies. And your blog is very interesting because it says, hey, if you want to be pro-life, vote Democrat. How in the world did you ever come up with this idea that a pro-life person ought to vote Democrat? You know, Paul, so I should, I should back up a little bit, give your, give your listeners a little bit of the background of kind of how I got here. So, so I grew up uh, strongly evangelical, strongly Republican, and strongly pro-life. Um, I was at the uh, the Bound for Life movements. For those who aren't or weren't weren't familiar, in the uh, early 2000s, we had red life tape over our mouth, and we would show up at abortion clinics at the Sacramento Capitol, the federal Capitol, all over the place. And the idea was we were going to protest till abortions over. And so that was that was what I was kind of steeped in uh, growing up. Um, and then in in kind of an experience that I had in a was it probably 2012, 2013 or so, started engaging more with politics and specifically with some more left-wing friends. And really abortion was the sticking point for me. And it's, it's fitting because abortion is the sticking point for so many people who are coming from a Christian background. And so I started to look into this and go, okay, if this really is the sticking point, what, what is the actual outcome? And, and I, I started to ask myself, you know, are Republicans really actually having a different outcome for abortion? And, you know, I, I expected that I would start to look at abortion stats and go, oh my gosh, well, you know, under Republican presidents, there's so many fewer abortions that, you know, if you're pro-life, obviously you have to be Republican. Um, and so that was really my working hypothesis, I guess, when I went into initially writing this four years ago. Um, as I started digging around, I started to go, well, you know, may, maybe they're even. And then I kept digging at the data and I went, wow, this is bizarre. The, 
not only is the abortion rate falling under everyone, which was what made me conclude, you know, maybe they're even. Um, but I, I really kept diving into that data and I went, oh my gosh, you look at these charts and the, the rate of abortion now has been falling since, and I'm sorry, I'm just pulling the dates up here, but since uh, about 1990, um, pretty much every year, the, the rate of abortions has fallen. That's the, the rate in terms of number of abortions per live births, per pregnancies, and then the sheer numbers have all been falling. Um, there's been one or two years that had an exception. Ironically, they were both under Bush. Um, I, I continued diving into that data and looking at, you know, how quickly does it fall under different presidencies and was amazed to see that it was falling dramatically faster under Democratic presidents than Republicans. So interesting. We're, so we're seeing abortion numbers drop and, and for years they've been going to low levels ever since measuring from Roe v. Wade. And but as you started diving into the numbers, under Democratic presidents, those numbers went lower than in Republican uh, administrations. Now, the question, of course, then becomes, is there a cause and effect there? Is it coincidence that it happens in, in to go down more in Democratic administrations than Republican administrations? Or are there a whole bunch of other factors to figure that go into that? Yeah, and that's exactly the question, and and that's to an extent the pushback that I've gotten on this article yeah. a, a bit from the folks who want to really negotiate in good faith has been, you know, okay, really, like, is there really a causal relationship here? So I, I want to start though with just how high the correlation is, because okay. uh, the the correlation is really remarkable. So, like I say, there's three different ways of of measuring um, abortion head counts and rates and such. So under Clinton, we saw a 23 to 36% decrease in abortions, depending on which, which way you measure it. Wow. Um, under Bush, those same metrics, it was a two and a half to 5% decrease. So this is about an eighth, give or take, of what we were seeing under Clinton. And again, when I was first looking at this data, I went, okay, it must have just plateaued. Like it must have been that we hit a, hit a floor and there's going to always be X number of abortions. I think so let me stop you for one second. Yeah. So was Bush's decrease? So there was a decrease under Clinton for the yep. eight years of the Clinton. And then was Bush's decrease down from where it came, where it was handed off to him from Clinton? Right, exactly. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Yeah. So if, if you're looking at a chart, it looks like it's coming down like this under, uh, under Clinton, and then kind of goes about like that under Bush. And if people or, go to the website npepodcast.com and click on uh, the blog that Lauren had there, it has a, a graph that shows that on it. Yes, which will be much much more accurate than my finger. <laughs> <laughs> I got it though. It, it yeah, worked. It worked. Uh, so so what was interesting though was then I looked at Obama and the CDC data that this is all based on, and actually it's a really good call out. The graph there is from Snopes, um, but it is CDC data that they use. I. I Verify that myself. And um, we, we say that because some people just flat out reject anything from Snopes. It's become quite a Republican right wing narrative that Snopes can never be trusted and all of those things. Um, I think Snopes is like anything else. You read it and then you measure it against other things you read. You don't take anything just at its word. But to just discount anything that comes off Snopes is is a pretty bit lazy, I think, and uh, and not a really fair way to look at things. Yes, agreed. Um, so I then looked at Obama and the, the chart you'll see actually ends in 2012, which was when my initial article had ended as well. I then just recently refreshed it through the end of the Obama administration because the CDC finally released that data. And it was interesting because again, depending on which metric you look at, there was an 18 to 22% decrease under Obama as well. So this was after I thought, oh, you know, it must have plateaued under Bush. Nope, sure enough, Obama was able to make it drop again dramatically at about four times the rate that Bush was. So to come back to your, your causation question, you know, at that, at that point, it begs the question, you know, it, there's a very strong corollary. It could be random, you know, but, but it's a very strong corollary. And so I really started to just dig in and go, okay, in, in my mind, and again, this may be overly simplistic, but in my mind, what are the causes of abortion? And I, I think this is something that could be pretty pretty easily defended. So I looked at it, and I, I basically broke it down to an algebraic equation, which I'm, I'm sure will make a few people's heads spin, but it's not, it's not too bad. Uh, I love so, your brilliance to be able to do this <laughs> stuff, yeah. So the algebraic equation was, was U, so I, I said U is, is um, 
I'm sorry, U is annual unwanted pregnancies. So basically every year, how many people are pregnant and don't want to be? Right. P. So uh, unwanted pregnancy as a basic is the foundational cause of abortion. Somebody is pregnant right. and they don't want to be pregnant. Yeah. Right. Exactly. You can't you can't have an abortion if you're not pregnant to begin with. Right. And if you want to be pregnant, you're probably not having an abortion. And I, I do want to give the call out that there there are people who have abortions who want to be pregnant. They want a baby. There's a health reason that that for whatever reason they need to have the abortion. And I, I understand that it's a relatively small percentage. So that's really not what I want to dive into on this particular right. blog. Um, but I do have friends that have been through that. It is a really heart wrenching situation. And again, a situation where, where personally for me, I feel like that really should be a question between that family and their doctor and God. Right. Of how do we deal with this with our family? Gotcha. Um, so again, I, I kind of left that off to the side because it, it is a relatively small percentage. And I, I really don't think it's anything I have any business speaking to, quite frankly. Right, right. Uh, All so, right, so we have unwanted pregnancies. Yeah, so unwanted pregnancies is you. And then P as a percentage of those unwanted pregnancies that are terminated or, or where there is an abortion. So you've got you know X number of pregnancies that are unwanted. Some percentage of those will be terminated in abortions. We, we know this has gone on not just since Roe v. Wade. It's gone on for hundreds, thousands of years. Um, they've found historic ways of terminating pregnancies dating back, I believe, earlier than Jesus's time. Um, there are ways I believe there was a concoction in the Old Testament that told how to make that happen, So, yes. I, which yes, we don't talk is. about much in our churches, but it is there in the Bible. Yes, there is also a biblical concoction. <laughs> but even, even that aside, from a more medical perspective, there were some very interesting ways that they'd come up with to essentially facilitate an abortion. And they were... Yeah dramatically more harmful to the women than the, than the approaches are now um, and probably had a much lower efficacy and a much higher rate of injury. Yeah. Um, so, so I looked at that and went, okay, percentage, right? And then again, going back to our basic algebra, U times P equals A. So you start with X number of, or U, U number of unwanted pregnancies, P, the percentage that are terminated, that results in A, the actual count of abortions that occur each year. So, so I went, yeah, that seems like- And those are CDC equation. stats you're talking about. Well, the equation isn't from the CDC, but okay, the, gotcha. the abortion stats per year, yes, those, that would be CDC. So where do you get the, the unwanted pregnancy stats? So I don't have stats on the unwanted pregnancies. Um, right. So I, I don't have the number U, I don't have the number P. Gotcha. Got okay. The number A coming from CDC. Gotcha. Um, but again, logically, you would have to conclude that there is a U and there is a P in order gotcha. to get okay. A. All right. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, so I then looked at that and I went, okay, well, if if you have U and P and U times P equals A, again, going back to our, our pre-algebra, the only ways to impact A are, in, especially if you want to decrease, the only ways to decrease A are to either decrease U or decrease P. Mm. So if we have fewer unwanted pregnancies, that would decrease the abortion count. If we have a lower percentage being aborted, that would obviously also decrease the abortion count. So I, I started to dive into that and go, okay, how do we break this down? You know, what, what are the factors that are playing into these two numbers? So looking at you, again, the, the unwanted pregnancies, I went, this is a factor of birth control, illicit sex, a safe living environment, poverty levels, all of these types of things. So it's, it's basically what are all the factors that either result in somebody being pregnant or result in that pregnancy being unwanted, right? So if you don't have birth control, if you're having illicit sex, these types of things, that's going to increase the likelihood of a pregnancy to begin with. Right. If you have poverty, if you have an unsafe living environment, those types of things, that's going to increase the likelihood that that pregnancy not only occurs, but is actually unwanted. Gotcha. So those, those are what I saw as, as the U factors, we'll say. So these are important, again, because we're talking about causation. If, if the if abortion number of abortions go down during Democratic administrations at a greater rate than during a Republican administration, we're saying, is there a direct correlation between the two? And so now you're doing your algebraic equation. And so how does that measure up to the causation then? Right. So, so let me get into P here for a second. Okay. So P I broke into, into three different factors. I called them P1, P2, and P3. So P1 being what alternatives to abortion are there and how acceptable are they? The, the classic one here being adoption, right? You can carry the child to term, you can, you can have them adopted. But you know, maybe there's some other alternatives as well, depending on the family or, or that type of thing. 
Um, P2, is abortion safe, legal, and accessible? So can you can you get it? And and obviously, you know, our, our Republican friends are going to complain that I use the word safe, safe in the sense of of safe to the mother. And again, right. not a debate I'm going to get into. Obviously, if there's an abortion, the baby's ending up dead. I get that, right. understood. But but the safety for the mother. And then P3, does the mother have a moral or religious objection to abortion? And okay. so those those were the three that I said. Okay, those are going to impact. The, the rate at which these unwanted pregnancies are actually terminated. So I, I looked at that and went, okay, the Republican platform, what are we doing as Republicans in order to affect either you or P1, 2, or 3? And so I looked at it and I went, well, in terms of you, we're really not doing a whole lot. And if anything, we're actually making it worse. There's, there's a lot of our policies that negatively impact access to birth control. There's a lot of our policies that negatively impact access to a safe living environment that increase poverty, all these things. So I looked at P, alternatives. There are, there are absolutely Republicans that are working on alternatives that, that support yeah. abortion, support things like that. Again, within their politics, maybe not quite as much. But I, I do really want to give the call out to, to organizations like CareNet here in town. There's other ones across the country that are doing great work in that area and absolutely want to encourage that, want to encourage them to keep doing it, want to give a call, call out to donate to those organizations. They're great organizations. Yeah, we have one a pregnancy care center here in, in Fresno where I live that they, they do a great job of, of helping women through all of these processes. Yeah. And so so that's something where as Christians, I think we we're making an impact on P1. As Republicans, I think we're not really doing doing very much there. Um, so P2, is it safe, legal, and accessible? And this is really where the Republican uh, political group has come into play. And we've gone, okay, we're going to try and pull down the number of abortions by making it no longer legal, which by extension also makes it no longer safe. Because we, you know, we see the stories like what happened in Indiana, where somebody tried to do a DIY abortion. That's not safe. That's that's mm. not something that somebody should be trying to do themselves. Um, and so, so we've we've basically said we're going to impact this one metric and try and pull down the safety and the legality of it to try and reduce abortion. And then we've also, again, moral and religious objections, maybe slightly less with our politics, but certainly with our. Um, for people term it the bully pulpit, uh, you know, the, the Trump carries, uh, but, you know, and certainly from our, from our church pulpits as well, we've made a very big deal about P3 of saying we do not feel this is morally or religiously appropriate. And, and perhaps we should, right? This, this is not behavior that we want to be encouraging. So, so again, perhaps that's a good thing, but that's, that's really where politically we focused our effort is P2 and P3. Right. So, I then contrasted that to the Democrats and how they focus their effort. And so much of the Democratic platform is about you. And, and again, just to bring us back there, that's the number of unwanted pregnancies. And so a lot of what they're doing is about the, the Affordable Care Act, right? Let's make sure there is contraceptive available to anybody who wants it as part of their insurance. For that matter, let's make sure insurance is available to everybody who wants it. <laughs> Uh, right. <laughs> so there's there's been this huge focus on that healthcare side of it. You know, there's there's been the focus, and again, Planned Parenthood is a common Republican whipping boy, um, but they do a lot with birth control. They do a lot with women's health outside of abortion, um, and yet, and so so the Democrats have have done their best to make sure that stays uh, funded and to make sure that people have access to to that. Um, and then I'm, I'm not even going to spend too much time getting into safe legal, uh, safe living environment and poverty levels. I, I think that's probably been addressed in other articles, but oh. certainly that's something that the Democrats really, really dive into working on. And, and I would assume uh, the, the drop in the Obama era uh, probably has a couple of things. I think the, the, the morning after pill really came out and became acceptable at that time. And I'm sure that's had a big impact on the abortion numbers. And I think we're just seeing millennials are just living a different life than than maybe previous generations and, and maybe even not starting having sex as early and a whole bunch of other factors that are there. But again, I think your point is, if the goal is to have less abortions in America, see, because so, here's why this question is really important and why the work you've done here is, is, is spectacularly important for us to dive into, is 
the abortion issue is sort of that keystone issue of Christian politics. And, and it's an issue that I think is making us divisive. It's on an ongoing basis. I hear people saying, yeah, I don't like X candidate. I don't think they're qualified. I don't think they're good, but they share my stance on abortion. So I'm going to vote for them anyway. Um, it's also the, the issue that, that gives us permission to call people terrible things like baby murderer. Uh, so if we're going to have an issue that we stand on that causes us to be as divisive as anybody, if not the most divisive people in our culture, we better make darn sure we're standing there alongside God, yeah, that he's exactly. right there with us. And so the question is, do we really want to eliminate abortion or has it become about winning political battles and other issues have started getting conflated in there? And we've sort of come up with this mindset that we have to vote Republican for all these reasons. And I've always wanted to present like, guys, maybe if the goal was less unwanted pregnancies rather than less abortions or the goal of winning a battle for a law, it might start to change the idea of whether God wants us to be these divisive people in culture. Does that make sense? I, that's why I think yeah. what you're saying is really important. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, that was that was really really kind of where I started to get to was going, well, at the end of the day, it needs to work. Like whatever, whatever we're supporting actually needs to decrease abortion. And it's been fascinating because I've, I have messaged with different people on the evangelical right. And I've said, well, do you want to decrease abortion? And they're like, no, I want it to be zero. And I'm like, well, it hasn't been zero in thousands of years. Like that's not like, sure, we can want that, but that's not a realistic target or goal. A law is not going to do that. Yeah, no, a law is not going to do that at all. There's there's no no chance at all that a law is going to accomplish that it, it will put a law in the books it'll get people arrested or fined or whatever we're going to do but it's not going to actually eliminate it well we, we see I, I use this a lot south korea just just overturned their abortion ban and from and I've, I've researched this quite a bit so i think it's true and if it's not i'll recant at some point but everything i read south korea very christian influenced nation had more abortions per capita than the United States, even though they had a law banning abortion since the for the last 60 years. And they discovered in their research, like, oh, people are still having abortions at a very high rate in South Korea. It just turns out the rich can get them very safely and the poor get them in a very dangerous manner. And so that that law has been overturned in South Korea. So that's to me, that's that's real evidence that even in a Christian nation, if, if that's the goal of having a Christian nation, a law is not going to stop abortion from happening. Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm going to be really interested to see as that plays out, you know, when we look back 10 years from now, do the abortions spike? Do they drop? Do they stay the same? Right. You know, I, I suspect at least in the short term, there may be a little bit of a spike, but I, I think it'll be really interesting to see, you know, where, where does that settle? You know, when, when we had Roe v. Wade, you see a spike straight up immediately afterwards. Right. But then you see it subtle and it, it's coming it's coming back down. I think I've heard some people say we're actually close to the pre Roe v. Wade rates. Um, I, I forget who that was. That, that may not be accurate data, but I, I feel like I heard that at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these are we always throw out these stats and, we, you know, we, we hope that we've researched them as well as we can. And the, the other one that I like to point to is Alabama and Missouri recently passed very tight anti-abortion laws. And one thing that happened as a result of those laws being passed is that support for abortion in polling shot up. Yeah. Like America has always been right around 50, 50 or even 60, 40 against abortion in some ways. But when Alabama and Missouri passed their laws, that that changed and support for abortion shot up. And even more significantly, I think support for late term abortions shot through the roof. So I think it goes back to your premise that when we're pushing for the laws and people feel like the the right to have an abortion is going to be taking, taken away, they become even more affable towards abortion. And so again, it has the opposite impact and effect of what we're wanting to happen. Yeah, well, it's exactly the same thing you see with guns, right? When when we talk about, hey, let's get all the guns off the street, all of a sudden gun sales skyrocket. Right. It's it's the same thing. And obviously that's the the other the parties in reverse, but it, the same same principle plays out. I want to come back to something you said a few minutes ago, though, about the uh, the morning after pill under Obama. 
Yeah. Cause that, that's something somebody else called out as well. And the thing, the thing I said was if that really was the factor that did it, we would see that rate continue to drop fast under Bush or sorry. Yes. Under Bush. No, under, Obama, under Trump. Yeah. We would continue to see it drop under Trump. Um, but we, yeah, we would have continued to see it drop very rapidly and that also does not explain why it was dropping so rapidly under Clinton, right? So, so again, you're seeing this funny gap in between that can't really be explained by a new technology or, or a new thing being released, but is, is probably more likely related to policy. And, and again, even the mindset of, of the anti-abortion movement, if I, if I could say that, or the mindset, even that has a lot of people opposed to the morning after pill. I know many Christians that believe that's just as evil as abortion itself. I know a lot of Christians that are against uh, contraceptives altogether, or at least education in schools about contraceptives, when we've seen that this education and the access to contraceptives does drive down the number of abortions. So again, I think we just need to evaluate what is our goal? Is our goal political victories and winning for God, so to speak, and in doing so being divisive and, and driving, really ultimately driving people away from our churches and even some away from the faith? And that's where we're trying to evaluate what is God's place in this discussion in society? Yes, I would say it's probably not God's purpose for people to get into a situation with unwanted pregnancy and to end it in termination. But how does he see us as human beings in the middle of it? How does God have grace in the middle of that? And shouldn't what Christians do around that reflect that heart of God? Yeah. Well, and, and each time in the New Testament that you see Jesus physically stepping into this type of environment, you know, the, the one we always talk about is the woman caught in the act of adultery, right? Right. Each, each time you see Jesus stepping into that environment, you see him extending grace. You, you don't see him coming in and throwing the stone or, you know, either, either verbally or physically. That's, that's not the behavior you see. And I've, I've talked at different times about in the church Oftentimes, especially in our evangelical church, we hear a lot of grace, grace, grace as people are getting ready to sin, right? There's, right. there's grace for this behavior. God will forgive you, this, that, and the other. But then what I often see is once the result of that sin shows up, right? Somebody, somebody is pregnant, right? They're 16, they're pregnant. Once the result of that sin shows up, all of a sudden, it seems like that grace turns rapidly to judgment. And I I find it odd when I compare it to the way Jesus behaved, because what I see him doing is before the sin saying, no, that's sinful. Don't go do that. That's not, that's not going to be healthy. It's not going to work well. You know, similarly with, with Paul and others throughout the new Testament. But then what I see is once there's repentance and, oh my gosh, this happened that the vast majority of the time, there's a, a welcoming back and a, a grace at that point. And I think as Christians, we may have kind of gotten that a little, a little backwards. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I think we do the go and sin no more before chasing away the condemners. Right, right. <laughs> and and I think it drives people out of the church, you know, as the because because things happen, right? We we do things that we're not proud of. And if if what happens is when we come back to our community in the place we expect to find grace, and that community says, No, you can't be here because you're pregnant and you're 16, you know, what what does that tell this young woman? You know, and and where does she go next in order to find the support she's going to need, whether that support is to get through the emotional scarring of an abortion or whether the support is to get through that the new life that's now going to be created both for her and for this young child. Yeah, and I think what we don't realize that we're saying to the world out there, and I, I use this story in my novel, and, and it's a, it was based upon a true story I heard from a young woman that when she did find herself pregnant after making a mistake in her life, the one place she knew she couldn't turn for input at that point was the church, was her parents who were heavily involved in the church. She literally in her mind said, well, I can't talk to those guys. So she's going to other places to get that input and ultimately made this statement, well, I knew I was going to go to hell having for having the abortion, but I determined I would rather go to hell for having the abortion than to tell my dad I'd had sex. And that was wow. her thought process. And that's what we're telling the world. Now, I know that's not our intention, 
but that's what they're hearing. And I think we need to take that into our consideration of how we're posturing ourselves around the political issue of abortion. And I think comparing it to Jesus' life, when the Pharisees were saying, what do you think about this civil issue, Jesus? I think his answer was almost always, yeah, the kingdom of heaven advancing will take care of that. The, yeah. the Roman government will be taken care of and their oppression and their horrible tactics by the kingdom of heaven advancing through you, not by being Barabbas and the zealots and trying to overthrow that Roman government. That's live by the sword, die by the sword. And I think he would say the same to the church today. The kingdom of heaven will take care of the problem you see. Your political battle ain't going to work. And in fact, it's going to have the opposite impact. And, and that's what I keep trying to tell people. Yeah, no, exactly. And I, you know, I think the challenge for, for us in, in the position we sit in is figuring out how do we not become that on exactly the opposite side, <laughs> right? And, you know, I think, I think we, we start to get some pushback on that from, yeah. from the evangelical right community of, okay, well, you're just doing exactly the, the same thing the other way. Um, but I, I think you're right. It, we, need to, we need to remember we're citizens of heaven first, first and foremost. That is, that is who we are. That's where our citizenship is. And yet God put us here in this time, history, place, skin color, you know, a, amount of financial situation, all these things, right? He's put us here and he said, from, from whom much is given, much is required, right? And when you look through, okay, what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? It's all about how do you take care of the least of these, right? It's how do you yeah. take care of the widows, the orphans, the stranger, right? The, maybe the stranger without papers. I, you know, that'll, that'll be a different discussion for a different day. Uh, but, you know, how do, how do we take care of the least of these that we find ourselves interacting with? Yeah, that's so good. Uh, this, that's Lauren D'Amico you're listening to there. He heads up a, a Facebook page called Intersecting Faith and Politics and is a, a partner of mine on the nonpartisan evangelical and writes some amazing stuff. Is a brilliant, brilliant guy. And, uh, and again, I think this is a, an issue that we have to delve into. Sometimes my wife is like, why are you always talking about this? Because it's such an emotional issue for people. And for some people, it's just like, hey, it's murder. We're going to stand against murder. But I think when you look at the Bible, Jesus said, hey, you've heard it say, don't murder. I say, don't call your brother a fool. And if you're the one calling your brother a fool, you're the one that's due for hellfire, more so than the murderer themselves. And so I think Jesus would could make that point on earth today of like, you can be absolutely 100% right in your stance as a pro-lifer and be 100% wrong in your heart for people. And that's the challenge. But when, when we start to challenge that, it does get emotional for people. And you're, you're getting some pushback on this blog, like you say, and some interesting pushback, I think. Yeah, no, we, we definitely have gotten some pushback. And it's, it's interesting because it, it's come in two different forms, right? There's been, there's been the form of the people that want to have a conversation. And so they're saying, well, you know, have you considered this factor? Or, you know, I don't think you're considering all the factors or, you know, what, what you mentioned of the morning after pill. So there's, there's certainly been that type of pushback. And I, I love that pushback. So absolutely, if you're listening, give us that pushback. Those are right? the discussions we love to have. Those yeah. are great. Yeah, and we, we love to have them on the page. We love to have them on Intersecting Faith on our own Facebook pages. We, we love engaging in those conversations. What's, I, I won't even say baffled anymore because I've been in this for four years now. It doesn't baffle me anymore. But what's, what's uh, disturbed me, concerned me, is the pushback that we get that's more just antagonistic. You know, it's not, this isn't wanting to engage. This is just wanting to get angry. And so my, my wife had posted, um, I think it was actually another blog, but references similarly regarding abortion um, onto her Facebook page. And we had a, a former friend of ours, um, a, a member- A former of, friend of yours. A former, well, we haven't, we haven't engaged with this person much in, in several years, um, but they, they live in Reading. So we, we used to live in Reading years ago, um, go to Bethel, you know, they're a former teacher at Bethel Christian School went to Simpson, went to Pepperdine, you know, so this is, this is somebody who's very much part of that, that evangelical Christian base and somebody who, quite frankly, I had a lot of respect for, you know, somebody who I'd, I'd engaged with a fair amount, um, you know, in, in my younger years when we were out there and he just went at my wife in a way that, that just boggled me. And I, I want to read a couple of the things just to, to give a sense of, of what's going on. You know, you talked before about the level of divisiveness 
And, and I thought this was just, it, it's a good example. And it was, honestly, it was heartbreaking for me to read it and see it coming from somebody who I, I did have a lot of respect for as a Christian. Um, but it, it started with this meme that he posted and it, it said, you cannot vote to murder children on Tuesdays and sing, oh, how I love Jesus on Sundays. Oof. Wow. And I went, okay, this is, this is off to a great start. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> that's not a discussion starter, is it? No, no, it's not a discussion starter. But the, the next comment he said was he said, um, he, I think being God, has told you that what you're doing is wrong through his messengers that you rejected. And then uh, mentions mentions my mom, uh, so my wife's mother-in-law, and says, you cannot both hear from God and reject his message through his messengers. You've rejected your mother-in-law's wisdom, who's been following Jesus longer than you've been alive and has more wisdom and love than you and I combined. Yet you will not listen. Your offense at Trump prevents you from listening. And the wow, the uh, the interesting bit of trivia is that my wife has actually been a, lo- a Christian longer than my mother has. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he continued with, "I'm I'm really sad for you and Lauren. Unfortunately, you two have such an offense towards Trump that it's blinded you to God's heart and truth. Your offense has built a, fen- a fence around you and caused you to intellectualize our faith to the point of justifying deaths of newborns." I'm not calling you a murderer. God is if you vote for Biden and you're complicit in their party's values and actions. So I, I just want to. He said, I'm not calling again. you a murderer. God is. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. I'm going to read wow. that statement again. I'm not calling you a murderer, comma. God is if you vote for Biden and are complicit with their party's values and actions. Scripture says that in the last days, many will fall away from truth and the faith because of offense. I'm praying for you and Lauren. Your offense seems to have blinded you both. Wow. And I read that and I just went, this is, it, it's bizarre. It's, it's bizarre to me. And it's, it's bizarre to me when I see it coming from people who know me as a person. And I, I posted a couple of things in, in the last few weeks of it's, it's a strange situation I find myself in because I was in a certain sense, the poster child of evangelical rightism. Ism? I don't know if that's an ism. That's, anyway, I think it's a good word. Yeah. It's a good ism. Uh, anyway, growing up and I was, I was the kid that the, you know, Christian leaders were going, you know, look at Lauren, he's doing great. He's, you know, following the rules. He's reading the Bible, this, that, and the other. And it's, it's strange to me to now be on the backside of that where I'm getting attacked. I mean, I've had my faith question more in the last four or five years than probably any other time in my life. Um, And it's, it's been a very, an odd thing to walk through. Yeah, I think we're seeing that ratchet up too. And I don't know if it's the election or just the spiritual atmosphere, but we've been in this mindset that a Christian votes Republican and conservative for so long, it's hard to not to imagine it not being a fact and being somewhere written in scripture. I can't find it in there, but I'm sure it must be because it, it, enough people believe it. But again, guys, this is what we're trying to come back to. I, I, I'm not saying you should be changed from being pro-life to pro-choice. But what you need to look at is if this is a hill you're going to die on, that you're going to call people baby murderer, that you're going to say you're not a Christian if you vote for the other party, then you better make sure God is there too. The yeah. Pharisees were absolutely certain of their political religious position. This Messiah is going to appear. He's going to overthrow Rome. Israel's going to be restored. Israel's going to be made great again, I like to say. And that's what we have to shoot toward. And Jesus came and said, wow, you guys can see the sky and know the weather, but you don't know the signs of the time. And I think that's a little bit of what what we're seeing is, is we're missing a bit of the signs of the times because We've been in this mindset for so long that there's a political win for God coming that it's made it hard for us to see that there might be another way for God's plan to go forward. Yeah. Yeah. And I really want to call out that if if you being pro-life is really pro-life, like if, if that really is what pro-life means to you is I want to, I want people to exude life. I want there to be more life. If, if that's really what it's about. I'm not, I'm not telling anybody they shouldn't be pro-life. I think pro-life, at least as a name, I think it's a great term. And that's really why with this article, I said, look, if you're pro-life, like if that's really what you're about is, is we want to support and protect life, you need to vote Democrat. I, you call yourself a pro-life Democrat. That's great. You know, I, I don't, I don't call myself pro-choice because I, I don't, I don't personally, for me, it, it wouldn't, 
for me and for my wife, it wouldn't be for us a choice whether we were going to have an abortion or not, because I, for me, I don't, I don't feel like that's even a legitimate choice. So, so I don't go around saying, oh, I'm pro-choice. I'm just saying, look, I am pro-life, but for me, being pro-life leads me to, to voting Democrat. Yeah. And again, I think it's, what is the goal? And is the goal to have less abortions rather than win a political victory to, to impose a law? Um, I, I think it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. So very interesting stuff, Lauren. Appreciate you sharing that. We wanted to hit on one other uh, blog that we had come out this week that was written by a friend of yours that was very interesting and is a topic that I also love to dive into a lot. It was called Why I Cannot Not Vote Democrat, which is not the most grammatically perfect headline, but it has a, pur a purpose. So tell us a little bit about your friend's blog that uh, has really been blowing up on the page this week. Yeah. So when, when my when my wife was proofing the title, she called that out as well. She was like, this grammar is terrible. I was like, well, yeah, there, there's a reason for it. Just hold on. So so what we did was we responded to a, a meme that was going around. And several people have called out the fact that responding to memes is generally a terrible idea because they're, they're, so, yeah. they're not really intended to be responded to. But this this one was interesting. So it was it was entitled Why I Cannot Vote Democrat. Um, so we said, why I can't not vote Democrat. Um, but it, it went through seven different statements and Bible verses associated with those statements and tried to basically say, look, these are all the reasons that as a Christian, you can't in good conscience vote Democrat. And so they were, you know, they're, they're pretty typical things. They were, they were pro-life, pro-Israel, pro-debt, pro-work, pro-marriage, um, pro-law and order, I guess you could say, and pro-voting in, uh, in alliance with God's word. And those were all things that we kind of went, yeah, like those those all seem like legitimate things we should probably be in favor of. Um, law and order has gotten a, a strange definition lately. Um, but in general, the idea that that there should be laws that govern the country, I think, is a, is a good and very biblical concept. Um, and so so I, I had seen this and I actually called it out on intersecting faith and politics. I, I posted it up there and I said, hey, this thing's starting to go around. Who wants to do a debunk on it? And so very quickly, uh, Dave Lester jumped in and started debunking it. And I said, wait, wait, hold, hold on. Like, I want, I want like a, a full page article here, like something, something that we can really sink our teeth into. And so he uh, was, was great. He's also a blogger. He has his own site uh, called Dangerous Hope. Um, so his, his site, dangeroushope.wordpress.com, um, he blogs there about Christianity, film, and life. Um, I have not nice. had a chance to to dive in depth into his blogs, but but certainly want to give him the give him the props and and uh, hi highlight that as well. Well um, done, well done. Yeah, but so he he jumped in and he he took each one of these and he went no let's let's say why this isn't valid. And so his was posted about I think right about twenty four hours after my my pro life article was posted, and we have just been getting so many people sharing, reading um, our, our server. I think I mentioned to you to earlier today, we've had three days of record setting uh, volume on our server. So we're, we're just getting all sorts of interesting reactions to these. And I think what I'm finding is that people are, they're ready to have some really fact-based arguments that they can dig into and, and really sink their teeth into. And so a lot of people have said, you know, thank you for the, the resources. I'm going to bookmark these and you know, be able to share them with friends when these topics come up. So the website uh, is npepodcast.com, nonpartisan evangelical npepodcast.com. And uh, the blog is why I can't not vote Democrat. Uh, the blog that Lauren was talking about earlier is if you're pro-life vote Democrat. And uh, again, the question is, we're challenging these precepts that have become so ingrained in evangelical Christianity, or maybe I should say white evangelical Christianity, that every once in a while, I think it's important, Romans 12, 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can know the good and perfect will of God. So I think it's important every once in a while to step back and say, where are these precepts, these mindsets coming from? And so that one had seven of the right-wing talking points that have now been codified into scripture by right-wing uh, evangelicalism. Uh, I read an article and shared out the other day, uh, there's a man named Wayne Grudem, who is a theologian of some note in, uh, in, in my circles of Christendom. He wrote an article with 25 of these 
talking points of why you have to be a conservative Republican if you're a Christian. And, and to me, it's, it is, we've conflated biblical with political. We're, we're taking political talking points and standards that aren't necessarily wrong in and of themselves to be important in our voting, but we've made them litmus test of your Christianity. Like I say, I'm like you. I've had my Christianity and my faith questioned now on a regular basis because I have the audacity to question our politics. And, and so I think what, what Dave really did well is starting unwinding some of these points that we've now conflated as scriptural when, in fact, they're political and can be argued and wrestled over. Yeah, yeah. And it, what, and what's, I, is there any one of them that you loved that he, he debunked well? Oh, goodness. Um, or at least refuted well, maybe? Yeah. Well, I mean, he, he, went, after, he went after pro-life, and I guess he, he took a different angle, which I think is also really important um, from the angle that I took. So mine was was really based on how do you bring down, you know, the the abortion count, and he really went after pro life from a from a different angle of wait a sec if you're pro life you can't just be pro an unborn life you need right. to be also pro an immigrant life you need to be pro an older person's life you need to be pro the life of somebody who can't get health care so he he really went after that and he said you know pro life needs to be a much broader term. And it was interesting. It actually echoed something that Chris Christie had said, gosh, probably five years ago or so. And I'm, I'm not personally a huge Chris Christie fan, but I, I thought it was an excellent point that he called out at the time he was uh, speaking specifically about drugs. And he said, look, if you're pro-life before the person exits the womb, if that person is born into a family where, where for whatever reason, you know, either as a result of the family, as a result of the systemic issues, or for whatever reason, they end up on drugs, are you still pro-life? Are you still pro their life? And are, are you pro their life not being lived out in jail for the rest of their life? Um, and, and so what do we as pro-lifers, what do we do for those people? And what does it look like to say, yep, we are still pro your life and we wanna help you get rehab. We wanna help you re-enter society and, and live, live life. That's good. I should note people may hear some sound in the background. This is COVID living. My wife is working in the other room and I can hear her. So I'm sure the audience can as well. So I apologize for that. But it's it's life in COVID days in the United yeah. States. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's really important. Uh, and to echo that, you know, one of the things I like to challenge people with is, hey, we've now by some estimates killed. And when I say we, we uh, the American culture. Um, the, the American military has killed 180,000 plus Iraqi civilians yeah. in a war that we went into under false pretenses. If I'm pro-life, that should mortify me. That, that should get me out of my chair as much as anything else. And so, yes, pro-life is a whole lot of things. But, but again, this conflation. So what the Pharisees did is they're, you know, Jesus, this Roman taxation is horrible and evil and, and just something we really need to focus on as the church really encouraged those zealots to get out there and overturn things. And Jesus said, nah, give to Caesar what's Caesar, give to God what's God. I believe what he was saying there is don't get confused with what God is taking you to in a season with what your political stance is taking you to in a season, what your human desires are taking you to in a season. And could it be the same today that, that Jesus would say, yes, I love the family. I love the traditional family, but be careful that you don't make that a Christian litmus test. That isn't God's standard at the time. Maybe he loves the non-traditional family too. And he can do amazing things through non-traditional families. Maybe there are cultures that don't believe the white evangelical mom, dad, two kids and a white picket fence is the perfect family. Maybe they're more village oriented and, and, and kids being taken care of, of multiple families. Let's not make something scriptural and a litmus test of your Christianity and thus how you vote that isn't necessarily in the scripture. Yeah. And I think so. One one thing, and I mean, this could this could be way more than the eight minutes we have left. But yeah. I'll, I'll kind of open the door <laughs> slightly. Um, one one thing that I found interesting that I've I've found myself doing over the last several years, and I I think in large part, it's what really ends up irking people, <laughs> is that 
for me, I've, I've gone, you know what, if I'm going to believe Christianity, if I'm going to be a Christian, if I'm going to follow Jesus, that doesn't mean that I say yes, and then check my brain and move on. Right. For, for me, and again, this is, this is maybe a little bit different. And so, so some of your, some of your listeners may find this really surprising. For me, I challenge my faith on a regular basis. Yep. And I look and I go, is this true? Is it real? You know, did Jesus really rise from the dead? You know, I, I think that's a question we ought to ask ourselves periodically and, and look at the new information that comes out. Read the, read the new things and not, not just read the ones that agree with us, but read the ones that disagree with us too. And I, I remember, um, gosh, this is probably 10, 12 years ago now, um, a friend of mine who was an atheist, he challenged me to read, um, what was it? I think it was The Death of Christianity or something like that um, by, oh man, I'm going to blank the name. The, the secular psychologist Freud, Sigmund Freud. Oh wow! Okay. So, so he challenged me to read that, and I think I challenged him to read the Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. And so we we swapped books and just went. You know what? Neither one of us are so sure that we are absolutely 100 right. So let's read each other's stuff and and find out. And it was it was interesting to read it. You know, did I become an atheist? No, I didn't. But it was it was very interesting to read that perspective and hear, okay, well, where is somebody else coming from on this? And I think as as Christians, and, and this is the part that, that may be a, a long deep dive, but one of the things we've done oftentimes is we'll have a core theology that is biblical. It's it's really solid, it's a biblical solid core theology. And kind of like the feudal lords, we'll have our castle, and then we'll build a wall around the castle, and then we'll build the moat just in case, then maybe we'll, <laughs> we'll stick some alligators in it and stick another wall around that. And by the time you get to the outermost layer, it's not biblical. Quite frankly, sometimes it doesn't even resemble anything biblical, but it's designed to protect us from, from having that core biblical theology challenged. And I think there may be a time and a place for that of going, hey, we, we don't want to constantly be re reviewing, did Jesus rise from the dead or not? And so we're going to stick a stake in the ground there. And that's not something we're going to review on a daily basis. But when we build so many walls and barriers and moats and alligators around that stake, I, I almost question, does it make it easier for our faith to be destroyed? And I, I always come back to when Satan first tripped up Eve, his question, he didn't ask, can you eat the fruit? He said, did God really say you can't touch the fruit? And the right answer was no. God did not, in fact, say that she couldn't touch the fruit. Right. But and I've I've heard some people say, and obviously this is extra biblical, their their personal theory, but their personal theory was that maybe by the time Eve came along, Adam told Eve, you know, we're not supposed to touch it, just or we're not supposed to eat it. You know what? Just don't even touch, don't even look at it. Just stay away from that tree. You know, just stay away from it. And I feel like we've we've built it out that way. And what we end up seeing, and I know I've I've found this for my own personal faith, was that the enemy would come in and and he would say things like, Well, is all of the Bible really infallible? And, you know, the first time I got hit with that, I went, oh, wait, what, well, what? And then I started to dive into it and I went, well, hmm, <laughs> is all of the Bible yeah. really infallible? You know, every single jot and tittle and every single sentence phrased the way it was in, in, you know, its particular time, maybe not, you know, but is the whole summation of the Bible and the way it works together um, very much the, the direction we should look to for faith? Yes, absolutely. But I, I think we have to be very careful. We've done the same thing with our politics. We have to be very careful of building these walls and saying, not only can you not challenge the stakes we've put in the ground, but you can't challenge any of those things that we've built out to protect that. Right. We've, we've built this narrative of, of being afraid of being deceived yeah. rather than being thrilled to let Holy Spirit lead us, guide us into all truth. Yeah. And so I'm going to make sure I don't pursue truth so I'm not deceived. And I think that does eventually harden hearts. And, and so again, let's, let's go back to what the overall purpose of all of this is, is if we're going to put stakes in the ground that become a dividing point between us and the world that we're supposed to love as God so loved the world, then we better make sure that's a stake God is demanding we put in the ground, not our ideology is requiring us to put in the ground. And I think we've thrown a lot of stakes in the ground that are man-made ideology rather than 
God-given theology. And when those get conflated, that's when bad things happen in the world. And so that's really the com compelling message for me to allow my faith to be questioned, because I want to tell people, no, God's not requiring you to think this way. That's Franklin Graham and Jerry Falwell Jr. that are demanding you think that way. And, and so really evaluate what is God's voice versus some long-term pastor or who else and make sure that we're constantly reevaluating that as we go along. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's always important to come back to what did Jesus say when yeah. he was asked, what's the greatest commandment, right? Cause that was, it was meant to be a trick question. Right. And it was interesting because he answered it like he did all the other trick questions people threw at him, but it was meant to be a trick question. And he said, no, this is simple. It's love the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And I have another friend who, you know, when asked, how do you know whether somebody's a Christian? He said, well, the only person who we know for sure that they went to heaven was the thief on the cross next to Jesus. And all he said was, Jesus is innocent. Hey, Jesus, remember me when you come into paradise. And I think our, our faith, if we, can, if we can do it, if we can bring ourselves back to that simple faith and go, you know what, this is really fundamentally about two things. It's about loving God and loving people. And the Bible says that if you can't love the person you, you can see, you're lying if you say that you love God. So God has put that one out as a litmus test and said, yeah. you got to love people. And I love which it. is really, really hard. But I think, I think if we can bring our faith back to that and say, okay, fundamentally, I need to love God. I need to love people. And I think there's a few extra bonus points there if you can show people that God loves them too. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. And <laughs> Jesus said, love God, love your neighbor, and then define neighbor as those people that don't worship the same way you do. Those yeah. people that are corrupting your religion, that's your neighbor and you have to love them. And in that, all of the laws are contained. So that's so good. And what I don't think, what, what has really been an eye opener to me since I stepped out of leading a church and started having these discussions is the people outside the church, the people that have left, have quit going to church, although in COVID now that's a lot more of us, but the people who have just said, I'm done with church. And then in essence, many of them have said, by rote, I'm done with faith, particularly the young people, almost universally, they point to it's that political stuff. That's what drove me away. It's that anger and vitriol and divisiveness that drove me away. I wasn't Republican enough to continue to attend my church. And that ought to scare us to death. That ought to scale, scare the hell out of us, uh, I would say, and, and say, Oh, God, if we're driving people away because of our ideology, we want to repent and repent now, and we will lay down the battle in order to bring people into the kingdom. And we're actually driving a generation away from the church and from the faith with this. And that's why I think, church, are you sure we're doing what's right? No, I, I read an article about that the other day, and I, I posted it, and I said, the summation of this article is young people are leaving the church because they're tired of being lied to. Oof. And I, I posted that and, you know, a lot of people have gone, wow. <laughs> you know? And it's, you know, it's one of those uh, tough love statements, Yeah. but it's, but it's really true. And, you know, we, we kind of started off earlier on talking about, you know, the fact that we've had our faith questioned and I look at the two of us and, and there's definitely many others like us that, other people have questioned our faith for me personally. And I, I don't even want to speak for you, but for me personally, I haven't questioned Jesus. I've questioned the church. Right. And yet I've looked around and I'm, I'm starting to have more and more friends. A lot of them are gathering on places like intersecting faith and politics. The, the Facebook group we've mentioned a few times now, I've, I've started to have more friends gathering in places like that, that they're saying, I don't go to church anymore. Just like what you're saying except they're saying, I don't go to church anymore. And I'm not so sure about this whole Jesus thing anymore. Right. And that honestly, that breaks my heart because it's like, I look and I go, if truly our goal is to love God and love people and to show people that God loves them too, but that's resulting in people going, you know what? I'm done with the church and I'm done with God. That's not good. We, we really got to rethink where we are. And, and I've been challenged as I interact with these people to go, okay, I don't want to 
I don't want to be another one of the voices saying, well, you got to come back to God because I know that hasn't worked. Right. And yet at the same time, I really want to challenge people to see, well, wait a sec, what you've seen in the Christian church, that isn't necessarily representative of what you see in the Christian God, who <laughs> unfortunately, maybe isn't so well represented by some of us here on earth that are trying to bear his name. Yeah, and and not to be too heavy on that idea, but there is this story where the kids are coming to Jesus and they try to chase the kids away from coming to Jesus. And Jesus ultimately makes this statement like, if you take one of these kids and, and in essence keep them from coming to me, it would be better for you to have a, a, a really heavy rock tied to a rope and that rope put around your neck and you be thrown into the ocean than to keep that kid from coming to me. And I've had people use that story about the abortion issue with me. But I tell you this, if we're driving the younger generation away from Jesus by our politics, chasing them from the church, that story <laughs> means is pretty heavy that Jesus may say, you know, it'd be better that you have a millstone tied around your neck and be thrown into the sea than to do that. So I, I think you're right. I just don't think there's going to be a time when we get to heaven that God says, man, you know, you just had way too much grace. I just got really tired of you loving people and having grace for them because Romans 2 tells us it's his kindness that draws people to repentance. And so again, Republican ideology, Republican, conservative, evangelical, make sure that it's God telling you to put that stake in the ground if it's a stake that's driving particularly young people away from the church and away from the faith. And I, I want to call out real quick what you mentioned about, about that verse specifically with abortion, because I've, I've heard it used that way as well. I am pretty sure I know where those aborted babies are going. Yep. I'm, I'm pretty sure those are all going to heaven and are, are all going to Jesus. I have a very hard time finding anything biblical to, to argue to the contrary. And so, again, is abortion awful? Yes. Is it killing a human or very close to a human or something like that? Yes. <laughs> but if, if what we really believe is that the absolute death is separation from God, I have yet to hear anybody argue with a straight face that those aborted babies are being separated from God. And yet the people in their, their teens, 20s, 30s, 40s that were driving away from the church and from Christ those may end their life separated from God. And wow. I, I find it horrifying when I read various verses from Paul, from Jeremiah, from others, where they talk about, I did everything I possibly could to lead people to God. Your blood is not on my hands. And that's not even a phrase we use in English in America very <laughs> often, maybe periodically, but generally not very often. But they they had an entirely different concept, I feel like, of what the mandate of evangelism meant. And, and Paul talks about it, that, that how horrible it would be for him if he didn't preach the gospel. And I, I think we're running, running a risk of a very similar situation of if we drive people out of the church by our ideology, I don't know, and I don't want to really speak this theology, but does God at some point look at us and say, that blood's on your hands yeah. because they, they were following me until you chased them away. And again, I, I, I'm not going to say I've got a chapter and verse to, to attribute that to, but I think it's a question we, we need to ask ourselves. Well, and I think what you can see through the history of the Bible is when the church gets to that place, the, the Old Testament would constantly say, if my people become hard-hearted towards justice, towards the world, his remedy was to overturn that church and to overturn that culture or allow it to happen by his mercy to get the attention of his people again. Happened in the days of Jeremiah. Isaiah called it out. Amos called it out. Jesus called it out. And that is what I think ultimately the outcome is of a church that says we would rather be ideologically pure than drawing, than failing in our ideology and drawing people to the kingdom. Yeah. And when that happens, I think God says, you know, my mercy is going to be to overturn this thing. And I think that may be a little bit of what's happening in this season as we're just struggling with this idea of first, a generation is rejecting the church. 
I mean, we, we know in the next generation, people aren't going to be four Sunday a month attendees. It's just the stats don't lie. It's just there. And now COVID not letting us go. It's time. It's time for the church to say, okay, what's the new thing you're trying to take us to here, God? And so you you and I are, are sort of leading an interesting experiment. We're, we're just gathering people online having a spiritual gathering on Sunday nights. We do the, the Christian tradition of, of communion, but, but I think we're just gathering people to share life and have discussions about these concepts we're talking about, I think could be something new in this season to start drawing some of those nuns and duns, as they're called in some, uh, in some uh, polls, uh, to come back and, and be around a community of faith. Yeah. No, I, I think there's, there's two things I want to get to on that. And one... <laughs> We did a deep dive here now yeah, in a way that we now, didn't now intend my, to do. Now my, now my brain's running in two different directions. Um, but one is, as as people have talked about the church, the verse that's always referenced is don't neglect the gathering together. And I was talking to somebody, yeah, and I was talking to somebody the other day and I said, does the Sunday morning church actually satisfy that verse? And it was, it was an interesting conversation because I went, well, the gathering together, I mean, sure, we all get together in one place, but we usually come in right about when the first, eh, let's be honest, maybe the second song is starting. Right. And then <laughs> by the time that final prayer is happening, I don't know about anybody else, but my brain's thinking about food or whatever I'm going to do that afternoon or something else. But I'm, I'm not really actually thinking about who am I going to gather with in the building before we walk out the door. And so the conversation we were having was, you know what, we are, we've been so attached. I mean, during COVID, it's come out even more as, as pastors have said, no, we're going to hold church. We've been so attached to this concept of coming in and gathering in a building. And yet there, the stats of the people that are part of small groups are part of virtual small groups, like what we're doing, are still incredibly low. And going, I think if I, if I really look at that verse in Hebrews, I think that verse is talking more about what we're doing, more about, you know, calling somebody up on the phone, um, you know, calling or having the person call you late at night who's just going, oh my gosh, my mind's coming undone. I think it's more about that than it is about gathering together on a Sunday morning. Wow. Uh, I do remind people from time to time when that verse was written, it was illegal for Christians right. to meet in big buildings. <laughs> so there's no way that verse was pertaining to meeting in a big Sunday gathering. They could only meet in small secret gatherings in homes. Um, and and it went on to say, and encourage each other all the more as the day approaches. So I, I think you're right. Community is more that going to a really nice building with really comfortable chairs and a great sound system and a smoke machine and all these other things. Yeah. Because I think what, what the generation today is looking for is let us ask those questions. Um, let us have these discussions. Let us bring our fears and our doubts and let that be a part of our discussion. And we've had guys, and, and I almost hate to mention names sometimes because it just people immediately shut out, but, but we do have people like a Rob Bell who is starting to, to raise these questions and, and we chase them off. But Andy Stanley's another guy, a pastor of a church in Atlanta that, that wrote a book called Irresistible um, that I gave to my daughter because my daughter was in college. And as always happens or happens quite often, she went off to college and the professor starts to say, now, you know, the Noah story is just a fable and not true. You know, this didn't really happen. You know, this about the Bible, you know, this is a contradiction right here. And all of a sudden the kids are like you said, you lied to me. Yeah. This is not the true story. And so I do think, uh, and so I would encourage anybody, six o'clock on Sunday nights, we always put the link on our Facebook page. Uh, you can get it on the NPPodcast.com page and come join us and, and, and have those discussions and share life. I think that's what Christian community is all about. And just to clarify for the people in, in my circle listening, that's six o'clock Pacific. So that's oh, uh, yes, eight, sorry. eight o'clock yes. Central, seven Mountain, <laughs> and uh, was that nine, nine Eastern. If you're in Arizona, I have no idea what time it is. Yeah, you'll have to check Greenwich Mean Time if you're somewhere else <laughs> yeah. around the world. But everybody is welcome. And yeah. what I love about it is we tell people, if you have soda and a potato chip, we'll take communion with soda and a potato chip. Whatever you got, that's what we'll do. And one, one other thing I wanted to call out is I've found it really interesting in the past several months that I've been hearing 
voices that I trust, voices that I don't trust, prophetic voices, voices that I'm not sure if they're prophetic, but all sorts of voices across the spectrum calling out that God is doing a new thing in this season. Mm-hmm. And I know you you wrote a blog post about it. Um, like I say, I've heard people on the far right that are making exactly the same statement. I suspect they're picturing a very different new thing than the new thing that you and I might be picturing. Yeah. But ultimately, I think what we're I think what we're seeing is I think the Holy Spirit is speaking to people across the spectrum and saying there's something new coming, get ready. And so I think that would be the challenge that I would give to people is is make sure you're ready for whatever that new is. And it may not look like what you and I are expecting either. You know, it it may be something completely different. Right. Um, but but what I think we do know, again, because we're hearing it from so many different angles is I think we're in for a a big shift um, in our spirituality, potentially in our country, you know, that that's going to be remain to be seen as the election comes and goes. Um, But I think in our in our Christianity, I think there really is a a shift coming. And I I think being spiritually, mentally, emotionally prepared for that, and and ready to follow the Holy Spirit and go where he leads. Because we've seen so many times throughout history, whether it's Jesus, the various revivals in America and everything in between, uh, you know, Martin Luther King. Um, no, sorry, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King. Martin Luther, Luther. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and Martin Luther King Jr. as well, I suppose. True. Uh, but we've seen throughout history these times where the Holy Spirit is moving in a new direction. And you really, you really end up in one of two buckets. Either you get left behind or you jump on the train. And so I, I would really challenge everybody to, and, and challenge ourselves too, to be, be emotionally and spiritually prepared and, and watching, right? Jesus always said, I say to you what I say to everyone, watch and be watching and waiting to see what is that new direction and how do we jump on board and be part of it? Love it. And I guess I would just put a capper on this by saying to some people, again, in, in, in my book, I have a story of a woman whose life has been impacted by the shame of having a couple of abortions in her life. And that shame, ultimately, the character of Joseph in the book tells her, hey, that that shame was put upon you by people, not by God. God doesn't hold that against you. And, And so for anybody who's listening to this, and we have people from a number of different religious perspectives who watch, I just want to say God is not mad at you. That's kind of my ongoing theme phrase. God doesn't hold any of those things against you. If you're a post-abortive woman, if you're a Democrat, if you're um, if you're a queer person, uh, if you're or a Republican, yes, or or any party, um, but any of the things that the church has put shame upon our culture about, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry that men, that human beings, did that but that's not God's position towards you. And um, so I want to invite anybody who would hear that and put themselves in that category to just reach out to us and contact us. Lauren's on Facebook, Intersecting Faith and Politics. You can find him there, my Facebook page that you're on here or through npepodcast.com, our Sunday night communion spiritual gatherings, and just say, hey, I, I I don't know why. I just want to reach out and say that that resonated with me. And if God's not mad at me, I want to have more of a conversation about that. And we would love, love to have that conversation with you. Yeah, absolutely. So good. Well, Lauren, your brilliance always blows me away. And we could talk a lot longer with some of the deep concepts you're going into here. But the blogs are, I can't not vote Democrat. You can check that one out. And what's your, yours is I'm a pro-life or if you're pro-life vote Democrat. Yep. All right. Check them out at npodcast.com. Love to hear your comments and thoughts and all those things. Do you want to finish with a prayer? We started with one. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, yeah. go ahead. So again, Father, I just thank you for this time that we got to share together. And and Lord, I just pray that that you would impact people's hearts with what whatever it was that you had for them to hear out of this time, Father, that if there's if there's things that they just found offensive, Father, that you would just allow those to just glance off and keep moving, God. But that that whatever you had for them in this season would would be impactful to their hearts, Father. And and Lord, as as Paul was talking about, Father, if there's people here that have have gotten fed up with the church, have walked away, God, that you would impact their heart with your love, Father. You you say that it's it's the kindness of Christ that leads us to repentance. So, Father, I, I pray that you would just show 
show up in their lives, show up in their hearts, Father, in a way that only you can, that they would, that they would feel that kindness resonating in their hearts, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome, Lauren. Thanks for giving me a lot of time today. This is, this is great stuff. And love your writing. Keep it coming, and, and people will keep following it. Sounds good. Well, thank, thank you as well, and uh, look forward to a weekend and uh, seeing, some, seeing some more interesting comments coming in. <laughs> yes, sounds good. And uh, don't forget, my wife Ashley and I do a Facebook Live podcast on Saturdays, about 1030 on Saturday morning, Pacific time. Uh, you can join us for that and have more conversations. And again, six o'clock Pacific Sunday night, if you want to join for a kind of a spiritual community and hang out with us. So thanks, everybody for watching. We'll see you guys all soon.